So my name is Ani Gellis, and I'm the Community Programs Manager at the BMI. I'm delighted to welcome you all today to this afternoon's program. This is part of our new series called Lunch and Learn, which provides the opportunity to hear about significant artifacts, collections, and moments in Baltimore's industrial history from experts at the BMI and other institutions. If you have suggestions for future topics, please let us know in the chat, or you'll also receive a survey via email and you can share feedback that way. This program is being recorded and we'll be posting it on YouTube in the next day or so. For those not familiar with the Baltimore Museum of Industry, we are located on the waterfront just south of Baltimore's Inner Harbor, and we're dedicated to telling the stories of workers and entrepreneurs who built Baltimore into a manufacturing powerhouse. One of the permanent exhibits in our food processing gallery currently shares information about the history of brewing in Baltimore, and we're looking to update this um, to focus more on the history of corner bars and consumption. We hope that this program, as well as the Community Collecting Day on Saturday, which Rachel will tell you more about, will connect locals with a family connection to bars in Baltimore to the museum. So for more information about that, I will drop a link in the chat to our archives manager, Maggie, and you can um, email her if you have questions or want to get involved. Programs like this are made possible thanks to the generous support of our members and donors. If you're currently a supporter, thank you. If you'd like to find out more about becoming a member, I will drop a link to the chat in the chat to our website, thebmi.org. And your support will help ensure that we can continue to engage people in conversations like the ones we're looking forward to today. I am pleased to welcome Michael Cavanaugh, owner of The Backyard on South Schroeder Street, as well as Dr. Rachel Donaldson, curator of collections and exhibitions at the BMI as today's presenters. I will let them introduce themselves. Over to you. Thank you, Ani, for the great introduction. Um, so yes, uh, what we're gonna be doing today is uh, kind of a two-part talk. First, I'm gonna get into the history and then Michael is going to talk about his experiences as a uh, bar owner in today's Baltimore. So what we're doing today is what we hope to be doing in the exhibition itself by connecting the past to the present. So Michael, we're really excited to have you and thank you again for being a part of this. Um, thank you. Pleasure. Wonderful. Um, as Ani mentioned, uh, we are going to have a community collecting day. Um, the content of what we're going to be discussing, the role of neighborhood bars in Baltimore, is very much a Baltimore story, and it's your story, and we want your stories to inform our interpretation. So this Saturday at Checker Spot Brewing from 2 to um, 4 p.m., I will be there along with Maggie Marzoff, our um, archives manager, to digitize any pictures, papers, various ephemera that you may have in your own collections um, to be either a part of this gallery and also to be part of our archival repository. Um, so if you, if you have any questions about uh, materials or, you know, what's going on with the gallery or just want to have a beer with us, come on down to Checker Spot again uh, this Saturday from, from 2 to 4. So um, this is, again, to kind of give you a little bit of a preview of what we're going to be discussing in this gallery um, and give you kind of the content of this. Um, as Ani mentioned, we're moving from just focusing on the production of alcohol to looking at the consumption, specifically the role that working class neighborhood bars played um, in community and culture, in, in developing community and culture in Baltimore. And the period of interpretation we're really focusing on is between 1870 and 1920. There's a clear end date, we end with prohibition. And that's because prohibition really does change the nature of bars as community centers from the kind of the pre-prohibition era to the post-prohibition era. Um, the 1870s is a little bit more murky. We're starting there because this is kind of the, the rise of the second industrial revolution, um, where you have the establishment, I am so sorry, um, of my phone just went off, um, and it's still going, and I don't know how to turn this off. <laughs> um, I took my receiver off the hook, but apparently that's not working. It will end eventually, I apologize. Um, so yeah, so 1870 is because the second industrial revolution when cities like Baltimore really took off. And so we're looking at the workers and their communities that they developed during this time period. 
This time period is also referred to as the saloon period. Um, so I'll be using the term bar and saloon interchangeably. But most importantly, this was a period when bars were known as working men's clubs. And that's not just a term that historians place on bars. It's actually something that during the time period, they referred to as working men's clubs or the poor men's club. So that's what we really want to unpack. What did it mean for these sites to be working men's clubs? And just a kind of a note about this too, it's not a misnomer to call them working men's clubs instead of just workers clubs because these bars were overwhelmingly, though not exclusively, male spaces. So we're going to talk about what did it mean for these spaces to develop? What did these mean for developing and reinforcing notions of working class masculinity? Um, so these are kind of all of the issues that we want to touch upon today um, and through the exhibition itself. So let's get started. What did it mean to be a working men's club? Well, bars served many functions. There are places where uh, you could cash and spend a paycheck, where men could send and receive mail. Uh, there are also places where men could get um, receive assistance during times of need and find out about jobs um, if one was out of a job. And importantly, they were provided some of the only public restrooms <laughs> available. And that's again, a very important function. But the most important function they served, and proponents and opponents of saloons recognized this, was that they served a social function. These were social centers for the men who, men who patronized them. In fact, saloons were known or basically embodied the concept of the third place. And the third place is a sociological concept, kind of made famous by the sociologist Ray Oldenburg. And the idea is that in your adult life, there are three spaces that really dominate. The first is your domestic space, your home. The second is your place of work. And the third are community sites or places that are really important for community cohesion. These could be places like barber shops, beauty salons, and of course, bars. Um, at third places, they're not exactly, you, you would have a network of people, a community, a community of people that you wouldn't necessarily invite to your home and wouldn't necessarily see at work, but you expect to see there. <clears throat> and so these, again, are really important places for uh, community development and for community cohesion. And so the kind of leisure, the kind of recreation that saloons provided was very communal in nature. You didn't go there for solitary drinking. You go in there to see people and, they, and everything was kind of designed for that, um, where they would have things like billiard tables or pool tables, card tables, things that again, fostered more of a communal activity. According to a report on saloons in 1893, these are some of the principal attractions they listed as Baltimore saloons as having. One, baseball and other sporting news. Uh, they also had newspapers, both daily and weekly. Music boxes, um, <clears throat> excuse me, occasionally dancing and singing, gramophones, moving pictures, tables and chairs. The free lunch was abundant and gambling was, quote, not at all uncommon. Um, and this was the report was actually done by an anti-saloon league. So it were the temperance advocates who were trying to be like, okay, what are saloons providing uh, that week so we can understand them in order to counteract them? So it's actually because of the uh, uh, activism of temperance advocates that we have a strong historical understanding of the activities that took place in these places. And there were a lot of saloons. Um, two areas of the city where saloons dominated the social life for working men were, according to this report, the southeast end of the city, lying along and east of Broadway, and, the, and south of Baltimore Street. The other thing that saloons had that also you know, made them accessible was they had really convenient hours. In most cities, they opened at 7 or 8 in the morning and were open until 1 a.m., um, so men working a variety of shifts would be able to access them at, at various points. Now, during the saloon period, working class bars catered to a regular crowd. This was not an era of bar hopping. In fact, it was usually per saloon, the same group of around 50 or 60 men who would keep it in, in business. So if any of you are thinking of the Cheers theme song, you would be right, <laughs> because that is very characteristic of what these places were. They were places where everybody knew everybody's name. 
<clears throat> exactly, this is kind of fostering the sense of becoming a regular and again, these, these strong network ties. So there were some distinctions between bars. I'm gonna talk a lot about the commonalities, but first I wanna get into the different clientele. Um, you have, of course, saloons across the city, uh, but they are catering to different ethnic groups. There is a strong tie-in between the saloon period and the rise of immigration. And so you have saloons catering to specific ethnic groups. You didn't necessarily have saloon owners from that ethnic group, but if you had a saloon, if you owned a saloon and you were, say, German, and you had a saloon in an um, a Irish neighborhood, you made sure that you had an Irish bartender. So whoever was kind of facing front facing with the public usually had to be of that ethnic group. And the immigrants who patronized saloons, of course, did so for a variety of reasons. But one of the key things was because these were safe spaces during a time <clears throat> excuse me, when immigrants faced a lot of hostility. Of course, you have rampant nativism of anti-immigrant um, activists and pro-immigrant restriction people um, who were trying to stop the flow of immigrants coming into industrial cities. These would culminate in a series of quota acts that specifically targeted immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. Um, this, the culmination of this was the National Origins Act of 1924 um, that severely restricted <clears throat> the number of immigrants coming in. Um, so in the face of this hostility, immigrants carved out saloons as their own safe spaces. They were places where they could speak in their native tongue. They could you know, converse with fellow countrymen. And they were simply places that were familiar. And in saloons, you could see kind of the microcosm of ethnic neighborhoods. So we think of places, ethnic enclaves like Little Italy. Of course, we still have a Little Italy. But at this time, the late 19th and early 20th century, you had many subdivisions. There wasn't going to be like one Little Italy covering all Italians. Um, for example, in Chicago, there were 16 different Little Italies. Um, you have a Little Italy for the Genoese or the Barres, and they would have their own drinking establishments catering to people from those regions. Um, and so again, this is why these were so important. And the kind of other thing to remember about saloons is they were really culturally conservative. Things did not change. And that was by design because they were designed to be familiar, to be comfortable, to maintain traditions and the like. So that's going to shape the kinds of activities that happened there. But saloons weren't just divided by ethnic group. You could also have saloons that cater to particular occupations. You, there were some bars called like, for instance, the Mechanics Exchange or the Milkman's Exchange. Um, and those of course cater to people of the you know, working group. So this of course was important for um, you know, people trying to find jobs. So if you're a mechanic out of you know, out of job, you'd go to your mechanics exchange and see if there was work available. Um, this becomes a little bit dicey with unions because sometimes unions wanted to take that power away from the hiring practices away from saloons. So there's going to be tension there in some respects. But in other respects, you had saloons that were specifically tied to uh, particular uh, unions. In one of H.L. Mencken's recollections, uh, he wrote that uh, one of uh, George Ruth, Babe Ruth's father's bars had a union bar sign over uh, his establishment in the Southwest neighborhood. And Ishmael Lincoln's father never went there as a result. You also had bars that were tied to particular political parties um, and they would have meetings there and same thing with unions as well. So this ties in also to the different functions and also the different characteristics of different saloons. So while you have kind of different clientele and clientele that would kind of be diverse uh, across the board, the one thing that was uniform was the architecture of bars. Um, even today, when you're driving around neighborhoods, you could tell the what looks like a corner bar. Um, and I'll kind of get to that a little bit more, but especially when you have two entrances to a building, that's how you could tell if it was a bar, there's that double entrance. Um, but the interior spaces looked almost the same. And that's why I love this quote by, by George A. Because it's true, you've seen one, if you've seen one, you've seen them all. So the, the uniform design was you would go in and there would be a bar running the length of the bar room proper. And those were usually made out of uh, oak or mahogany. And on the other side, if there was a room, you would have tables and chairs. But 
overwhelmingly, these were stand-up bars where you go, you have the brass rail, rail kind of step up and order your drink. You wouldn't have bar stools. Um, the only kind of seating would be at tables and chairs if they were offered. So you have the entire bar running the length. Um, and then behind it was a narrow walkway where you could see in this picture, um, George Ruth and uh, Babe Ruth in the center. And that was again, the domain of the bartender. And behind them would be the display. So usually you would have a plate glass window in front of which you would have shelving showing the different kind of liquors that were being served. Um, and again, this was constant. If any of you go to Second Chance, there was an entire bar that was removed actually from a former bar in Locust Point that was for sale. And it had all of these elements. Um, one other thing I kind of want to point your attention to is you'll see that there's not a brass rail in this picture, um, but there is that kind of trough in front of it. That trough acted as a spittoon. Um, so from my understanding was that at the end of the night, they could flush it out by running water through. Um, and the bar that was for sale at Second Chance had that spittoon still there. If you didn't have that trough, you would have spittoons or cuspidors kind of situated at various intervals. Um, and then oftentimes they would have sawdust on the floor to clean up any spills or people who missed the spittoon. Um, but you had, so that was kind of the, the interior. Also had to have gas lamps hanging su suspended from the ceilings. And this again was pretty much in every single one. Um, and many also had, but not, not all of them would have a semi-private back room. And the back room was really important for meetings, for union meetings, for political meetings. And was also one of the only places that women could access. Some saloons had a second floor, and on that second floor was where they would have more communal activities like dancing. Um, but that bar room proper, that was a men's only space. Um, so another thing we have to think about is, again, with all of the, the number of, of saloons everywhere, what made this possible? Yes, you have the patronage of the same 50 or 60 men, but are they really keeping in business? Not necessarily. What made saloons possible was the direct res uh, result of sponsorship by breweries. According to a study of uh, breweries, uh, sorry, saloons and, um, and, and restaurants in Baltimore in 1901, there was uh, listed 1,899 saloons and restaurants. And so you gotta think, yeah, what, what made these possible? So in the 1880s, um, actually even, even beforehand, you have the uh, competition happening between alcohol distributors and al alcohol producers, especially, especially brewers. <clears throat> and brewers become much more prominent in you and, and throughout the U.S. after the first wave of German immigration that resulted from the revolutions of 1848. So it's by the way, the 1850s that you have a, a big wave of Germans coming over, and they're the ones who are establishing German breweries. And so these breweries are in intense competition with each other. And so to get, gain a leg up on the competition, they try to go directly to urban consumers in these industrial cities. And they do so either by directly financing, opening up their own bars in a system called the Tide House system, or they would provide loans um, to people to open up their bars, or they would in established bars have um, direct distributor contracts with them. And, and it was known what you would get at this at the bar. That's why I love this picture of this picture um, of this this bar on Green Street. I think it says from 1908. It's like, oh, I wonder what's being served there. I mean, it's like you have globe beer signs everywhere. Um, so uh, so yeah. So th this again is a direct result of breweries sponsoring them. And so the breweries had did a lot to shape this saloon um, era and a lot of kind of what they provided in addition to the drinks, they provided the establishments. And so you had a situation where you could have multiple types of whiskey, which was the other drink of choice, but only one type of beer. Um, so, uh, so that's something to kind of keep, keep in the back of your mind, what made this possible. The other thing that brewery, uh, brewers did was they had a lot of, not necessarily control, but they really kind of shaped the interior spaces as well. They tried to make them as homey as possible. One of the other things that um, made saloons so attractive to people is that, you know, they were homey spaces. 
And even members of the Anti-Saloon League recognized this. They were places where people wanted to go. They were, again, what the, the, whole, the old adage, they were warm in the winter, they were cool in the summer, or places you wanted to go and spend time. And this is at a time when a lot of working class housing was really crummy. There was you know, overcrowding, dilapidating conditions. So people really only went home to sleep or to work if your home was a site of work. Um, so they did their socializing outside of the house. And this is for men as, as well as women. Um, so breweries would try to make these saloons as homey as possible. But again, much like the kind of the, the structure of the bars themselves, there are certain characteristics that you would always see. Number one would be colorful beer advertisements. And these would change by the season, essentially. So again, like, you know, these framed things would be very attractive. And here's a, um, an example from the Library of Congress. But there are two other elements that really go speak to the fact that these were male spaces. Um, according to the historical commentators on saloons, there are basically two forms of art you would always see. One was a picture of a prize fighter. Um, more often than not, John L. Lewis. So oh, we're gonna, no matter what bar you're gonna go into, you'll find the picture of the prize fighter. And the other was a picture of a female nude. Um, and this is what we could have see this in this as uh, a picture from a saloon from the, but that was submitted to the Baltimore Sun. And you can kind of see the female nude up in the, um, in the corner uh, up there. Um, and I love this. There's uh, descriptions even of what these, these paintings were like. According to Travis Hoke, um, who wrote about um, saloons in the 1920s, reflecting back uh, for American Mercury, he commented that these pictures were of, and I quote, the female form divine, a large form, demonstrably female, and perhaps ostentatiously healthy. Uh, George Aid, who we saw his quote on the uh, previous slide, described to them as having figures as like bass fields. So very curvy women <laughs> were featured here. Um, and again, those were kind of the two ubiquitous things in these, in these male spaces. But in addition to providing the drinks, the bars, the decor, the other thing that saloons made, I mean, sorry, that breweries made possible was the phenomenon of the free lunch. The free lunch started in the 1880s. And it was, again, made possible because of brewery um, uh, subsidies. And there were response for a couple things. Um, for one, they were, again, a way that breweries could attract a loyal um, a clientele and a regular clientele. They were also done as a way to appease temperance advocates um, who wanted bars to serve more um, food in order to slow down the effects of intoxication. And I wouldn't be surprised if they're also done to appease employers. Um, because in bars a lot of nearby factories, According to the report on Baltimore from 1901, in some districts, it was a rarity to see a working man carrying a lunch pail. And that's because they all had lunch at um, saloons that offered free lunches. Now, drinking on the job is not new. It didn't start with saloons. It has actually much, much, much older, but saloons kind of did make it easier um, uh, to, to you know, have drink the drinks during lunch. So, um, so this is something that you would, again, tie into to drinking. It wasn't technically free because this lunch came with the cost of a drink. Um, this is in time where you also had women being able to access certain bars because the free lunch was accessible to working men and working women as well. Um, in uh, Baltimore and other eastern seaboard, uh, seaboard cities in the north, lunches were served at the edge of the bar and often can, was cold, consisting of bread, crackers and wafers, cheese, bologna sausage, wienerwurst, cold eggs, sliced tomatoes, cold meats, salads, pickles, and other relishes. According to the recollection of Ms. Mamie uh, Pilvin O'Leary, whose father owned a saloon near Gay Street, the free lunch at her father's bar was more elaborate. During good economic times, they would offer, and I quote, hot soup, Platters of cold cuts, potato salad, and slaw, always. During the season, there would appear crab cakes and deviled crabs. And when oysters were here, there were always hot fried oysters along with a large cake of ice scooped out in the middle and filled with spiced oysters. Incidentals as celery, pickles, and cheese were always in sight. To get this, you had to purchase a beer for five cents, a whiskey for 10 cents, a glass of whiskey for 10 cents, 
or a glass of 10 year old whiskey for 15 cents. And this was kind of done on the honor system. You really only had to buy uh, one drink, but the idea was you would go and fill up your plate and just eat that. It was it was frowned upon to get go back multiple times um, for this, even though there was not technically a rule against this. But as prices went up, sometimes the uh, uh, fare, the lunch fare went down. At uh, the last bar her father owned, um, she remembered the typical fare consisting of cold ham, cheese, pretzels, and boiled eggs but always a cup of soup. Um, and again, the free lunch was a very important phenomenon. According to a, a bartender in New York City in 1909, quote, the saloon keeper's free lunch saves many a poor fellow from starvation and hard times. A man may have a whole meal with a big glass of beer for a single nickel. Um, so again, the free lunch really kind of came with direct sponsorship by breweries, but after breweries got out of the game um, of sponsoring bars, um, after prohibition, the free lunch went by the wayside. So the free lunch, again, was very much a part of the working men's club or the saloon era. Now, as much as bars were sites of leisure um, for working class men, they were also sites of work and hard work at that. The bartender played a critical role in maintaining the atmosphere, you know, keeping, making sure things were going well, keeping a check on intemperate uh, uh, patrons, um, and of course, you know, running the bar itself and doing everything in between. Uh, they also served, again, a really important social role, and I really want to emphasize that, maintaining the atmosphere at the bar. Um, there was a popular book in the early 20th century, which was a joke book just for bartenders. So if there was a lull, they kind of like whip out one of the jokes from this popular joke book to get people laughing again. And again, recognizing the social role, that was another reason why you had to make sure that you had, you know, if it was an ethnic bar, that you had a member of that ethnic group um, as, as the bartender. Um, bartenders also became shoulders to cry on. Uh, this is according to a former saloon keeper again in New York City in 1909, and I quote, there is a some, sort of familiar affectionate feeling for the saloon keeper among these people. He has often been called the poor man's friend and is placed the poor man's club. And I must say there's a kernel of truth in this. All the drinkers at my place, with very few exceptions indeed, opened their hearts to me and George Barkeep, even when not encouraged to do so. They would tell me their secrets, their troubles, their entanglements, their domestic woes, their afflictions, and the drunker they got, the more confidential they became. But again, as workers, bartenders had similar grievances to other workers in the industrial, I mean, second industrialized, industrial era, and actually all <laughs> from the industrial revolution on up. And that is one of the main grievances for long hours. It wasn't uncommon for bartenders to work anywhere from 14 to 16 hours in a shift. So they did what other workers of this era did and they formed unions. In Baltimore, the Bartenders International League, Local 532, formed on January 25th, 1903 at Frank Souter's restaurant on East Fayette Street near Holiday Street. And this was affiliated with the AFL. In six months time, it grew to 384 members. Prior to this, there was the Bartenders Union, which was affiliated with the German Trade Union, but that began in 1886. And the Bartenders Union was more politically radical. Um, uh, it was affiliated with the, the Socialist Party. Um, so, but again, this is ties to the thing to remember, and this is something to keep in mind for any site of leisure that is also a site of work um, for, for people who operate it. The last thing I want to get into in kind of our brief historical overview is the connection to women. So as I said, these working men's clubs were overwhelmingly, but not exclusively women, unless they had a policy of not permitting women. So for instance, McSorley's um, in New York City uh, would not allow women in. Um, so that was, so you did have individual bars who specifically would not allow women in, but kind of across the board, particularly if they had a free lunch, Bars often did allow women in, but only during those times. So the space that women were able to occupy was that back room. And that's why if a bar did not have a back room, odds are it would not allow women. Um, the women would enter through a side entrance known as a ladies entrance or a family entrance. 
And this way they could go in, get the free lunch that was at the edge of the bar and go straight to the back room. They did not have to traverse the male space of the bar room proper. And women, working women who did eat their free lunch in the back room didn't want to be bothered by men. So it was this kind of like unspoken men wouldn't bother them, they wouldn't bother men, kind of each had their own space. Um, but this, even though women weren't allowed into the club life of the saloon, this doesn't mean that they didn't drink. The drinking patterns for uh, working class women were just different. So what women would do was engage in a practice that was known as rushing the growler where they would go to saloons during kind of lull times um, when you didn't have kind of men running all over the place. And they would come with some kind of receptacle, either a bucket or a bottle to bring back beer, whiskey, or wine, any kind of receptacle for that. And there they would get this, uh, you know, get their drinks and either drink in their home or more commonly would drink on, um, uh, you know, the stoops of their buildings um, or in back courtyards where they could socialize with neighborhood women um, and keep a watch on street life and children. Um, so again, it's not that women didn't drink, they just, they're just drinking, their social drinking happened differently. Again, still not in the home itself, um, but home adjacent. So just as kind of a conclusion, um, the era of the urban saloon really emerged with the period, again, the second industrial revolution of the 1870s, um, when immigrants and migrants flocked to um, cities looking for jobs. One thing I didn't mention, and you'll kind of may made a note of this, is that there's very much a strong tie to the story of immigration. Um, drinking establishments were, of course, important for African-American workers as well, but the history of African-American bars follows a different trajectory. Um, much like immigrants coming over, uh, seeking new jobs and seeking, seeking to escape oppression from home, you have um, a wave of African-American migrants fleeing the racial oppression of the Deep South and the lack of job opportunities to northern industrial cities. The, the wave is referred to as the Great Migration. And this really begins in 1916 um, and continues up through the mid 20th century. Um, but the bars that were established for um, African-Americans followed more of a pattern common in Southern areas. And this was the juke joint model. Um, unlike um, working class sal um, you know, urban saloons, juke joints catered to both men and women and they more often than not featured live music. Um, but these drinking establishments were as important for um, Southern, you know, for African American migrants who too faced intense racial hostility in cities like Baltimore. I just don't get into those of them as much in this um, interpretation, just because it follows again a different historical trajectory. So much of the saloon story again ties to immigrant rather than um, migrant um, histories. Saloons for the, the immigrants um, and other working people who use them provided a respite from the long hours, hard work, and poor housing that they endured. But the heyday of the saloon um, began to close even before World War I. And it was spurred by workers who were beginning to move out of ethnic enclaves into other areas of the city. And also they're facing the competition from new forms of cheap amusement like movie theaters. And of course, the strengthening of the temperance movement. So then we have, of course, the kind of cut off with um, the uh, era of prohibition. Of course, you do have speakeasies um, and the like, and you have other, other drinking establishments that were able to circumvent. Um, and then you had some bars that just totally flouted the law. Like, I don't know if McSorley's ever stopped serving beer <laughs> during prohibition, it may have. Um, but I think some, some places were able to kind of get around that. But, um, but even after the prohibition ends in 1933, of course you have bars returning, but saloons and the working men's club specifically did not. So with that, that kind of concludes again, our, our overview of the, the historical aspects of saloons. And now I wanna turn it to moving from the past to getting into the present. And I'm gonna stop uh, the share so that we can, talk to Michael Cavanaugh of the backyard. And again, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. And we have your beautiful bar in the background. <laughs> so again, great backdrop. So I was wondering if we could just open up, if you could tell us a little bit about what made you um, decide to want to own and operate your own bar. Sure, sure. Um, and thank you again for, for having me. And thank you for that tremendous uh, presentation. That was uh, excellent. Uh, well, very well done. Um, 
I think to answer your question about why, um, I have to give some credit to uh, to my mother and grandmother for showing me what uh, good hosts um, are, are like and how fun that can be. Uh, but also, um, I think to that neighborhood feel, the, the saloon, the neighborhood gathering place. Uh, I had lived in this neighborhood um, in Southwest Baltimore for a few years and really felt that connection with community. Uh, and when the opportunity became available to open the bar, it kind of made uh, a lot of sense to myself and my business partner to kind of be the neighborhood social gathering point um, that we can do kind of what we always love to do throughout our, our lives. That's great. So could you tell us a bit about, about your bar? And and, and I, I I have to apologize. I always thought it was in Pigtown, but it's in Holland's Market. So it's like right, it's right over the edge. Yeah. Big Town is literally across the street where the uh, the you know, Railroad Museum. Um, and the story of our bar is kind of what you just went over. Um, this this is very much your presentation was uh, the history of this business. Uh, we started in 1847 across the street as a basement bar. Uh, and as uh, more and more Irish immigrants uh, came to Baltimore to work on the railroad, they needed larger confines. And so in 1862, they built this building specifically to have more space to have a larger you know, space for people to gather. Uh, and it was in the same family until we bought it in 2018. Um, so they, they claimed to be the oldest Irish bar in the country with that, with that caveat. I'm sure there's some folks in New York and Boston that uh, might have uh, a quibble. Uh, about that claim, um, but we're very, very honored to be in such a, a historical building. Uh, we tried our best to maintain uh, in kind of a tip of the cap to the history of this building and the nature of, of the business. One of the things I was really impressed with in Senior Bar is that, you know, the it does really illustrate that kind of interior where you have like you have the bar on one side and like you know the bar running the whole length did you have to do anything in terms of um did you change anything up is it like what changes did you make to the bar if any it, it was a lot of um just updating so sorry about that sorry <laughs> my apologies yeah. um it was a lot of just uh, upgrading the equipment and a little bit of elbow grease to, um, you know, just kind of put a shine on it. But um, no, the, the bar behind me, this back bar was uh, best guest commissioned in the 1980s or 90s in Ireland and shipped over. Uh, and the bar proper uh, has been here for at least 100 years. Um, so that it was the same bar that you were uh, speaking about earlier with the Sabatoons. Uh, that would run run uh, alongside, so uh, you didn't have to leave your seat, um, so, so you could just you know, camp out and enjoy your free lunch and, and your beer, uh, you know, while, while you could just stay at, at your spot. Um, so no, it was it was you know mainly just uh, a lot of um, elbow grease to to kind of put a put a shine on things and and swapping stuff out, but we we did want to maintain uh, the kind of the bones and the the charm of the, the old saloon atmosphere. Great. Um, we had a question from the audience about what the bar was um, called beforehand. And I would like to also add to that to the, think about what made you decide on the backyard as the name for your bar? Sure. So uh, as, as far as we can tell, there have been many iterations of names uh, throughout the years. Uh, prior to us, it was uh, Patrick's of Pratt Street. Uh, prior to that, it was Ann's Steakhouse. Uh, but for a long time in the last half of um, the 20th century, it was Rowley's. And that was the, the family that owned the bar was, was Rowley's. Um, the backyard came to be as um, kind of trying to embrace the idea of being a neighborhood bar, being in your backyard, being comfortable, uh, being amongst friends and family. Um, and then plus tying into the yard kind of feel. There's the rail yard across the street, there's Camden yards less than a mile away. Uh, so kind of trying to embrace that feel uh, was, was how we landed on the name. That's great. So we talked a lot about the, the functioning. And as you said, you wanted to be kind of a neighborhood spot and kind of you know bring that, that spirit alive today. 
what does it mean to be a neighborhood bar? Because everything that I was talking about was much, but like, what did it mean to, what was the function? How did it serve the community, you know, in this time period? So what are the things that you provide and that you see as necessary to being a neighborhood bar today? Sure. I mean, I think the basic, um, just as, as a place to come and eat and drink, um, you know, and however you, however you enjoy that, that's how we're trying to facilitate that. Um, but it really is about being a community center uh, and being a place where, where you can come out and to your, to your point, it's not home, it's not work, it's another space for you to uh, engage with, with friends and family and neighbors. Um, and that's kind of the, the ethos that we try to, to have is, is how do we create that space? And, and thank you for bringing up the uh, bartenders uh, job, uh, because sometimes you wear many hats when you're on this side of the bar, not only a therapist and the cop, but you are uh, a host. And uh, how do you create a space for everybody, and especially in, in, in such a diverse city that we live in, how do you create a, a, a space in which everyone feels comfortable and everybody is wants to, to be there and wants to come back? Um, so that's very important with, um, you know, when we talk with our team about how do we do that job, because that's what we're trying to create is an environment in which everybody can feel comfortable and happy and engage in the ways that, that they want to engage. That's great. So what are some of the challenges you face? I mean, because again, as you said, you're wearing so many different hats. So what are, I'm sure there are, but what are some of the challenges that you feel like come with? with this job? Sure. Um, certainly the, the long hours, again, as, as you know, bartenders, um, any small business owner will, will know that it is, you, you just, you are, you have all the, all the different departments uh, fall under, uh, under your, your watch. So um, you, you are the uh, accountant, you are the, the legal team, you are the, um, the the procurement office. Um, so the amount of, of work is certainly a challenge in and of itself. Um, navigating uh, the, the different permits and the different, um, you know, the health department, the liquor board, all of those things are, are a challenge. Um, I, I think that's, that's really the, the, the main challenges. Obviously, the last few years have, have added another layer to those challenges with uh, a, a pandemic and how to operate uh, during that was was very difficult. Um, but you know, my, my grandfather always said, you know, if 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 you don't feel like it's work, it's not really work. It's not a job. Um, if you love what you do, uh, and so my, my business partner and myself, we we love entertaining. We love having people. We love seeing people enjoying themselves eating and drinking we like nerding out about all the different beers and whiskeys and wines and and all the stuff we've we've cult curated our, our own uh selection so it's at the end of the day it, it uh, sometimes feels overwhelming but when you uh when you put down a plate of food in front in front of somebody or they have you know drink beer that that they're really pleased with it makes it all worthwhile Wonderful. So before we get into the Q and A, um, and um, Ani, I was wondering if you could help with um, any uh, uh, anything from the chat um, that stands out because I actually maybe I can access it. But before we get into that, do you have any stories um, that you would like to share with us? Anything that stands sure. out? Any experience? Um, and specifically from from this period, um, it was it was very interesting. Um, you know, just prior to that. It would, this bar in 1862, uh, my uncle was actually in here and thinking about uh, the Civil War at the time. Um, and the railroad from the north didn't connect to the railroad from across our street. And Baltimore um, famously being, you know, this, this interesting brackish water between the uh, north and, and south during the Civil War, there was a lot of Southern sympathizers. And um, as the troops would come down on President Street, they would have to walk across the, the city to get to the B&O to take it south to Antietam or, or wherever. Um, 
and famously there was there was a riot that happened uh, where there was a clash between Southern sympathizers and Union soldiers. They were coming walking down Pratt Street to get on the train, uh, and and shots were actually fired. Um, so it, it's a very interesting kind of place to be. Also to think about that this bar could have been the last beer that a soldier had before he got on train to go go fight. Uh, in Virginia or elsewhere, and it also might have been the first beer that that they got when they came back. Um, so the, the if these walls could talk, the stories that they would tell. Um, the other um, story that I like to tell is um, that's actually the prohibition. How this bar survived through through prohibition uh, was that they became a laundromat. And, <laughs> And so uh, the workers from the railroad would come with their bag of laundry and drop the laundry in the front and then go wait for it to be done in the back where who knows what, what happened in the back, but um, they, they turned themselves in, into a laundromat, which is, uh, which is pretty fun. Wow, that's, that's what I'd love to get more stories of how bars survived prohibition with creative means like that. <laughs> Well, that's great. Well, thank you so much. I want to kind of shift a bit to some of the, the Q&A in the few minutes that we have left. Um, and so I see that there's some, I'm actually now able to access the chat. Um, there was a question about free lunch is consistent at bars um, uh, countrywide or just within cities or smaller towns as well. That's a really good question. Now, the thing about um, studying history is that you're limited by your sources to a degree. So the his history and historiography, which is kind of how historians have studied a particular topic of um, bars, it's, the, it's fairly recent um, and it really does focus more on the urban context. And I think that that's probably because you have more resources available. Not saying that you didn't have um, bars in, in smaller towns and stuff like that, but the idea of like, kind of like the saloon culture and the like is more of an urban phenomenon. Um, but you do have free lunches kind of across the board. And there is like a, a, a gradation. Free lunches uh, were better actually in the Midwest and uh, the West, when you have, um, uh, there was something, it had to do with liquor licensing, um, where you had a, even more bars who were in, in even deeper, steeper competition with each other. So you would have more hot lunches in a city like Chicago than you would have um, in a city like Baltimore. Um, so I think it was more of like, you would have variations um, based on the size of the city, but still it would be more of a, a city phenomenon rather than um, a, a country phenomenon, except when you're dealing with the South. Um, and again, you're, of course, having southern cities, but what I mentioned at the end, particularly with um, uh, African American bars, um, the juke joint uh, phenomenon or the rise of juke joints, there needs to be more history done on those. But from what we could tell, they established more in, um, in industries that are in the south, but more industries that were happening in rural areas like turpentine camps or lumber camps. Um, so that is, again, whole different um, uh, phenomenon that's happening, not in a city, not even in a town. Um, so you're going to have kind of a, a different a different phenomenon. And obviously, they're not going to tie into the, even anything close to the free lunches because the free lunches were made possible by breweries. And it wasn't just kind of a service, and it was breweries in competition. So if you don't have an area where a brewery is in competition with another brewery, probably not going to have a free lunch, is what I would guess. Um, but uh, take it with a grain of salt, because that is kind of a historical conjecture. Um, so that- oh, You don't mind to add, uh, to, to your point is, um, um, I think you're spot on. Uh, another interesting uh, thing between saloons and breweries was the, there was no refrigeration at the time. Um, so for, for breweries, that, you know, for a saloon, you had to pick between the breweries around you and so in these in the cities the free lunch became um kind of a competition between the breweries to which saloons they could provide the type of beers were, were not as wide as we have today they were very basic just your your basic lagers ales uh, you know very very limited selection so it wouldn't vary from brewery to brewery so the free lunch was also a way for the breweries to compete with one another to see which saloon they could get into, and with the amount in Baltimore, there was a, a lot of you know a lot of avenues for breweries to, to go to. 
Great. Thank you. Yeah, I love that. Um, and uh, another question that came up was, uh, does the BMI have a plan to have a permanent exhibit on Baltimore brewing history? And we actually had an exhibit on brewing history that we're changing now to the, the corner bar. So um, we don't have something that'll be brew, like the story of brewing specific um, in terms of our, our permanent galleries, but that story will get incorporated into um, the redesign, uh, the extent of which is still being determined. Um, but that's we'll also need to have more, we can have more programming on breweries too. Um, our next community collecting day is at a brewery. Oh, and the other thing that I, I think is interesting, thinking about uh, community spaces as well, is breweries having their own tap rooms. Like, Michael, do you actually do you have any thoughts on that? Like, has that affected you know the you know bars themselves? Uh, what's the relationship you have with with breweries? Yeah, it, it's it's interesting because in the last. Um, you know, five years, we've, um, in, in Cape Town, we've become kind of a, a brewery central. We now have uh, four different breweries that are within a mile of the bar, um, which to, to us um, is 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 kind of cool. We, we like it uh, just because, again, hearkening back to the idea about the beer that you're drinking is brewed so close away um, so not only is it very fresh, uh, but it has a very small carbon footprint to it. You know, in, instead of uh, trucking it from St. Louis or Milwaukee, I can go, you know, a half mile into Pig Town and get fresh beer. Um, that's, that's great. And I think it's also um, an evolution of the quality of brewing that's happening and getting more and more people exposed to that, I think is, is, is a really good thing. Uh, and I think it teaches people, you know, how to drink more responsibly when you're, when you're interested in the, the, the content of it, you're interested in the taste of it rather than the effect. Uh, so I think breweries are, are, are a very good way. You know, it's kind of counterintuitive that, oh, you have a place where you can drink a lot of beer, but it's like, well, the atmosphere matters. Uh, so I, I think it's 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 very good. We actually are developing a passport program in our area to partner with them uh, because we all offer something different, uh, mm -hmm. but we all have the same mindset about how do we create an environment where people can you know, eat, drink, and be merry. That's great. And I think that that's an excellent point that you raised, that, that there, this different types of atmosphere um, is kind of a, a key thing. Um, you actually have another question here. Uh, do you fill growlers? Yes, we do. Uh, we we uh, have uh, we actually so we have the old tavern license, which is the which is how saloons operated. Uh, we can operate from six a.m. to two a.m. Uh, seven days a week, and uh, those aren't our hours. Uh, I don't think I would be standing if they were. Uh, but uh, we we do we can sell on premise, and we can also sell uh, to go. So we not only do growlers, but uh, bottles of wine, bottles and cans of beer are half off the menu price. So we very much enjoy that. Um, also speaking about our, our draft list with, with our growlers, uh, we have a three hour rule uh, for our drafts that uh, the brewery needs to be within a three hour drive, no traffic, uh, to, for, for us to put it on, on draft. So kind of supporting that local regional idea uh, and trying to you know, kind of reduce our carbon footprint in that regard. Great, great, thanks. So I'm uh, one other, I'm trying to go through the, there is a question, um, but I'm not seeing it in the chat. Um, so I am sorry to Margaret um, that I cannot find your questions. Um, but, uh, oh, Ani, do you have that? Yes, let me, uh, so Margaret had quite a few questions. So how about we talk a little bit about um, temperance? or the relation between temperance and prohibition. Um, but she also had questions about brewers putting logos on their glasses, dress code, music, the words mm -hmm. pub or public house, um, zoning regulations, wow. how to start a bar, and what was it like being in a border state? Wow, Margaret, those are great questions. <laughs> and I wish 
we had more time. Um, one thing, I guess, uh, what really quickly that I'd like to get into is the, the temperance movement. So if you think about the temperance movement, it was about thinking about the root of temperance is to be temperate. It wasn't about prohibition. It becomes prohibition by the, the 20th century, but it was about much more about just kind of curbing drinking. Um, but by the late 19th or early 20th century, it's not just about the, um, you know, people targeting, uh, uh, um, drinking itself or drinking patterns, it was specifically targeting saloons. So a major organization in the temperance movement was the Anti-Saloon League. Um, the other thing that really made the temperance movement, what, what actually led to the success of this movement was World War I um, because of the strong anti-German sentiment. Because the, the temperance movement in the 19th century focused more on spirits um, rather than beer, but because of the connection between the German connection to breweries um, and, and beer brewing, it turned more towards beer um, and, and Germans became the target with the anti-German propaganda of World War I. Um, so between the anti-saloon league and the anti-German propaganda targeting breweries, these two things really coalesced into leading to the Volstead Act. And then, of course, uh, prohibition as well. Um, but um, but so that's kind of like a very quick and dirty <laughs> like what, what was going on with the, the temperance movement. Um, and uh, I hope I hope that that answers answers that question. Um, and then there was something about I guess there was a question about a dress code. I don't know if it's then or there. Um, but uh, but yeah, I hope that. Hopefully that answers them. And you know, again, if you have any other questions, you know, Michael is <laughs> knowledgeable to go to the backyard, which I highly recommend. It is an excellent bar. Um, and so I just want to to thank you again for for being a part of this and being such you know a, a community center. Um, yet again, oh, oh wait a minute, sorry, we do have a couple minutes, and I now see your questions. I do want to say something about music um, because there are studies that are done on what types of songs were really popular, um, that not, not were being performed, but that men would sing to each other and the, the topics. And the number one song, the number one type of song, I guess genre, was songs about mothers. So you would get these really maudlin songs about you know, drunken men singing to each other about mothers. Um, and uh, that was a popular thing. Oh, one other thing too about the, the temperance movement quickly, is that with these places being like community centers, yes, intoxication was a thing. You know, we're not gonna deny that, but intoxication wasn't necessarily getting, going and getting drunk wasn't really the purpose. It was going and being social and being with that network of people that you would get at, at your third space. So one of the uh, temperance movements, uh, you know, or prohibitionist main, um, Propaganda tools was like the picture of like the girl, you know, the little daughter trying to drag her drunken father off the bar stool. <laughs> and that was not terribly common. Um, it was, it, again, it was a form of propaganda because mostly men were there to hang out with other men. Um, Michael, did you, I see you laughing. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, it's, it, that is um, funny. Just, and the other thing about the temperance movement uh, to, to realize was that that alcohol consumption in, in in our country at the time was significantly high, um, and and that's the, there's another reason why the temperance movement was um, to, also to your point about how you know they coalesced, but there you know the, the average per person uh, consumption in the in the late 1800s was very high, um, and so that's also you know, why the temperance movement started, and and to your points, Rachel. How, why it, how it succeeded in arriving at prohibition. Great, yeah, and you're absolutely right. Yeah, the, the high drinking people, as, I, as one of my professors said in undergrad and undergrad history class, like they would drink you under the table. <laughs> she was talking about uh, early Americans in the early Republic, but yeah. <laughs> so I think that is an excellent note to end on. Um, thank you, Michael, so much for joining us. Everyone, I highly recommend Backyard. Check it out. And again, if you're interested, please come to our Community Collecting Day um, on Saturday and definitely come to the museum when we open up our new gallery. So thanks again, everyone.